Today we are going to continue in our passage from Mark chapter 12. We will close out this chapter and the sermon is titled, Who is Jesus? One of the big questions everybody needs to answer in life is this question, Who is Jesus? Looking through the lens of eternity, he will either be your savior or he will be your judge. Those are the only two answers that you can provide and how you base uh, or, or how you answer this question is very important. Jesus has provided ample evidence in the scriptures and in the book of Mark for his divine identity and he has spoken to the leaders of Jerusalem and we recognize that they were spiritually blind by their response to what Jesus was teaching them. And they were una unwilling and unable to see the evidence that was right before their very eyes. They struggled with it. They couldn't figure it out. They didn't understand. All they saw in Jesus was the fact that he was a threat to them. The leaders of Jerusalem hated Jesus. They, they provided evidence of, of misunderstanding in their responses as to who the Messiah would be. Jesus provided evidence that clearly came from the Old Testament scriptures, and it was something that no Jewish leader could refute. And in the face of scriptural evidence, the Jewish leaders were left speechless. The Jewish people believed that the Messiah would be an earthly ruler, that it, he would be a, a man of immense power, that he would have influence and impact, but he would be nothing more than a man in their eyes. They believed he would lead the nation of Israel to conquer their enemies. And they believed that he would accomplish all of the promises that were made to Abraham and David. They believed in the past and they continue to believe to this day that the Messiah would be able to build and establish a never ending earthly Jewish kingdom. He would be a man that would restore the nation of Israel to its glorified past. But one additional point I want to make about the Jewish nation is that they only saw Jesus as the Messiah for themselves. This belief brought the Jews of Jesus' day into direct conflict with what he was teaching. Because Jesus claimed to be much, much more than just their Messiah. As we know, the religious leaders of Israel hated Jesus for the way that he attacked their corrupt operation of the temple. They hated Jesus for the way he exposed their corruption in their lives. They hated Jesus because he claimed to be more than just a man. In fact, Jesus to their faces claimed to be equal with God. And that infuriated them. We see Jesus' conflict with the religious leaders begin back in chapter 11. And, and we built our way to the day. Back in 11, uh, the chief priests and scribes challenged Jesus' authority, if you remember that. They asked, who gave Jesus this authority to clear out the money changers from the temple grounds? Where did that authority come from? They challenged his authority. And since that time, the Sanhedrin, the Jewish ruling council, they were trying to get rid of Jesus. They didn't want him there. They were disrupting their lives. They, they did not like what he was saying. They did not like what he was doing. And they wanted him gone. In their minds, he overstepped his authority and he had no, act, no right to exercise any authority in God's house from their perspective. First, these men attacked Jesus publicly and openly. And then they moved to underhanded attacks where they tried to, to get Jesus caught in some kind of conundrum. And they tried to undermine him attempting to publicly humiliate him in the eyes of the people. And the first group of people that came with a trick question were the Pharisees. And what did they trick him about or try to? Who should we pay taxes to? Should we pay them to Caesar or to God? And what did Jesus say? He responded with whose face is on the coin? It's Caesar's. Well, render to Caesar what is Caesar's and give to God what is God. And they were dumbfounded by it. They could not trap him. Secondly, we had a group of Sadducees who came with their trick question about the re uh, resurrection. 
And then last week we saw the questioner come before Jesus. He was a lone scribe and he asked Jesus about the greatest commandment, which is the greatest commandment. And Jesus being so thorough, he gave him not just one, but two because they're intertwined. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. Those two commands fulfill the law. Jesus never got entangled by any of their questions. In fact, each time the attackers were left looking more and more foolish. And we saw in the last verse that we looked at last week, verse 34, it closed with these words, and no one dared to question him any longer. They were silenced. They were done. Every time they tried to discredit Jesus, he would end up discrediting them. Beginning in verse 35, which is where we find ourselves this morning, Jesus is turning the tables on them. He began asking questions of them instead of them asking questions of Jesus. He set out to prove one thing that they refused to believe, that Jesus is more than just a man. He is the man who is also God. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for this awesome privilege to gather together to examine the scriptures. And I thank you for those who are gathered here who faithfully come to hear the word proclaimed. And I just ask that you would clear our minds and hearts of any distractions that would hinder us from hearing what you want to say to us today. And I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart would be found acceptable in your sight. Lord, you are my strength. You are my rock. And you are my redeemer. To you be all glory, honor, and praise. And may we go from this place changed and different than when we came in. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us begin by looking at verse 35 from Mark chapter 12. And it's on the screen if you don't have your scriptures. And this is what God's word says. While Jesus was teaching in the temple, he asked, How can the scribes say that the Messiah is the son of David? David himself says, By the Holy Spirit, The Lord declared to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. David himself calls him Lord. How then can he be his son? And the large crowd was listening to him with the light. <laughs> the first thing we see here is a pronouncement made by the Savior. We have a pronouncement made by the Savior. It says while Jesus was teaching in the temple, he asked. So my question is, what was he teaching? He was answering the question that was on the scribe's heart in the previous verses that we looked at. Jesus told that scribe, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And his unasked question was, what more is necessary? Well, here Jesus was sharing the answer. Because according to Mark's gospel, no one ever answered that question. But our Lord was driving home a very important point to these scribes. He raised a problem that no one had seen until he brought it up. The Messiah is both David's son in his lineage, but he's also David's Lord. How in the world is that possible? Think about it. What father would ever call his son or his great-grandson his Lord? Would any man do that? No. The Messiah is not just simply David's son. He is also David's sovereign Lord. He is God's son who reigns as king. He's seated at the heavenly father's right hand. And David's words will not work if the Messiah is just a human being. He has to be something much, much more than just a man. And this is where Jesus is trying to take them from their understanding of who the Messiah is to who the Messiah truly is. And this is what they failed to see. Tragically, men and women, even today, still do not understand and cannot see that Jesus is God in the flesh. Well, Jesus quoted here from Psalm 110 in verse 36 of our passage, and this is considered the Psalm of David, and it's a messianic psalm. And David, according to the Jews, was considered one of the highest authorities to which they would sit under. And when David says, the Lord declared to my Lord, sit at my right hand, he was calling the Messiah, my Lord. Now, all of these scribes to this point would have been on board with what Jesus was saying. They would be in agreement. How then could David re respond and refer to his descendant as my Lord? 
Was David saying that there was an authority higher than him? Well, the answer is yes, of course that's what he was saying. David recognized that his sovereignty was of the earth as king. That's what David knew of himself. But he also recognized the sovereignty of the Messiah, which was higher than his authority. But he knew that that Messiah, who would be his Lord, would come through his lineage. But his spiritual side was from God. Well, the Jews believed that the Messiah would be David's son, but the only way David's son could also be David's Lord and be the Messiah is if he was God in the human flesh. And that's what they couldn't see. They were blinded to that fact. They did not want to accept that. We know this because we know the Lord's miraculous conception and virgin birth. The Messiah was more than just the physical seed of David. It was more than the earthly conqueror that they were expecting the Messiah to be. So Jesus' question is, David calls himself, uh, David himself calls him Lord. How then can he be his son? That is the question that was supposed to open their eyes to this truth. And we know, of course, that he is descended from David according to the flesh, but he is Lord of glory according to his spirit. So Jesus here was correcting the common Jewish notion that the Messiah was going to be a warrior king like David. Jesus is more than just the son of David. He is the son of man. He is the representative of all humanity, not just exclusive for the Jews. He is the one who had to suffer and then be exalted to the right hand of God. And still more importantly, he is the son of God. And this crowd was delighted, no doubt, because Jesus was putting these scribes to shame. The question revealed the identity of the Messiah. Jesus knew that this would raise the stakes in his confrontation with these men. He also knew that the cross was waiting him just three days away. The moment of truth had arrived. Who is Jesus? Jesus begins simply enough by establishing that the Christ would be the son of David. And in John 7, 42, we read, doesn't the scripture say that the Messiah comes from David's offspring and from the town of Bethlehem where David once lived? It's still a popular belief, even among Orthodox Jews today, that the Davidic sonship of the Messiah is firmly and widely established in the Old Testament. I'm going to share with you a few passages of scripture that they still hold to, as we do. Look, the days are coming. This is the Lord's declaration when I will raise up a righteous branch for David. He will reign wisely as king and administer justice and righteousness in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will dwell securely. This is the name he will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. Jeremiah 23, verses 5 and 6. Folks, Jesus' identity is the central issue of life. Who is Jesus to you? Is he Lord? The whole issue of how we enter the kingdom and how we're to live in the kingdom of God hinges on how you answer that question. Is Jesus truly Lord of your life? Paul tells us that the whole creation is moving toward that final day when that question will be thoroughly and completely answered. When the last human record of war and conflict and evil will end. Then God will have finished his amazing and remarkable workings through human life and through human history. And it will culminate with a wonderful, great scene as we see described in Philippians 2, 9 through 11. For this reason, God has highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name so that the name of Jesus, at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and under the earth and every tongue will confess what? That Jesus Christ is Lord. Oh, I look forward to that day when every human that has ever existed will proclaim that truth Amen. to the glory of God the Father. So who is Jesus? That is the issue. Is he Lord of your life? Is he the one that motivates you to act in love? Does Jesus govern all that you say and every action that you take? Paul writes to the Colossians 
In verse 317, he says, And whatever you do in word or in deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Look at the facts, folks. Look at the facts about who Jesus is. And listen to the pronouncement that was made by the Savior throughout the scriptures. Let's continue in verse 38. Verse 38 says this. He also said in his teaching, beware of the scribes who want to go around in long robes and who want greetings in the marketplaces, the best seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at banquets. They devour widows' houses and say long prayers just for show. These will receive harsher judgment. The next thing we see here is a pretentious man is sentenced. A pretentious man is sentenced. Beware, he says here in this passage. Beware of what? Beware of those who put on a religious show. The scribes, most of whom were Pharisees, walked along in these long white robes, and they also wore this shawl that was called a tallit, and it was worn during formal prayer and other religious acts in the synagogue. And some scribes, wanting to flash their prominence, would wear those out in public to attract attention. And the greetings that they would receive in the marketplace were not ordinary greetings, but expressions of deference to their religious authority. They wanted to be set apart. They wanted to be lifted up on a pedestal among the common people. They liked to be greeted in the marketplace as everyone recognized their title and their profession. Then it says they wanted the best seats in the synagogues. Where were those seats? Those seats were a bench that faced the congregation in front of the chest that you see pictured here where the offerings were placed and also where the biblical scrolls were kept. And they could be seen by everyone. The places of honor at the banquets, those were to the right and to the left of the host at the table. That reminds me of the rebuke that James and John received when they were told that the place of honor was reserved for those who were servants of the least. Exactly what was involved in devouring widows and their homes is uncertain, but the scribes were forbidden to receive any kind of payment for their teachings. They either had to support themselves through some kind of secular employment, or they had to be dependent upon gifts from people for their work in the temple. Some may have even ingratiated themselves to widows in hopes of being willed their homes when they passed away. Because they may have found some kind of technicality in the law where they could lay claim to those homes because they were defenseless. They may have expected some kind of generous payment from these widows for whom they were praying for. Notice Jesus mentions the fact that they were known for their lengthy prayers. The Pharisees were teachers of the law. And most of the interpreters feel that their prayers are closely linked with the action towards these widows. Maybe their prayers were an effort to cover up their treacherous dealings with the widows and the fact that they were corrupt and wicked in their dealings with people. And Alan Cole says this in his commentary on the book of Mark. Quote, it is precisely because they pray that their condemnation will be the more terrible, more than that of a rogue who robs outright without pretense of prayer or religion. Greater knowledge and greater opportunities only bring greater responsibility, which can, if rejected, bring greater condemnation, end quote. That reminds me of the scriptures. Folks, Revelation has responsibility. And the more you know, the greater you are being held in accountability. Where does that come from? It comes straight from Jesus. Jesus said those words in Matthew 11, 20 through 24. One of the most dangerous vocations, folks, in this life is being a pastor. In case you didn't know that, it is a dangerous vocation to do what I'm doing. And one of the most dangerous places you can go is into a Bible-believing, Bible-proclaiming church that faithfully shares the truth of the scriptures week in and week out. Because each time you hear God's word taught and faithfully preached, guess what? 
You too will be held to a higher standard because you have heard the truth. And you are going to be more accountable to God. And the more you know, the more you hear, the more accountable you're going to be held. What did you do with what I gave you? That will be the question we are asked when we stand before the Lord. Tragically, those who often receive God's revelation become traffickers. And they take advantage of widows like we see in this scripture. Rather than walking humbly, they become proud and they make their ministries all about them instead of all about Jesus. We need to grow so near to Jesus that nothing else matters. And that we will only act the way Jesus would act. Because God will not overlook hypocrisy and sin, folks. It will be dealt with. The Bible says in Luke 12, 48, from everyone who has been given much, much will be required. And from the one who has been entrusted with much, even more will be expected. So what is that telling us? The greater our revelation, the greater our understanding, the greater our knowledge, then the greater will be our accountability. To know what is right to do and to not do it will bring about the harsher judgment that's talked about in this passage. No wonder James writes in James 3, 1, not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, because you know that you will receive a stricter, what? A stricter judgment. God will judge with special severity those who are religious hypocrites, those who strut around like peacocks and abuse the less fortunate and traffic in false worship with all show and no substance. Such wickedness and motive and action makes plain that they never truly embraced the greatest servant of all, Jesus, son of David, Jesus, the Messiah, Jesus, the Lord of all. These scribes were only looking out for themselves and they were pretentious and they will be sentenced by the righteous judge. Now let's continue in verse 41. Sitting across from the temple treasure, treasury, he watched how the crowd dropped money into the treasury. Many rich people were putting in large sums, and then a poor widow came and dropped in two tiny coins worth very little. Summoning his disciples, he said to them, Truly, I tell you, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. For they all gave out of their surplus, but she gave out of her poverty and has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. And here we finally see in this section of our passage a performance that was modeled for show. A performance that was modeled for show. The religious performance among these scribes and Pharisees had reached such an absurd state of affairs here. The historian Josephus tells us that some of the Pharisees, before they made their contributions to the, the temple treasury, they actually summoned a trumpeter to go before them to make an announcement that these guys were coming. Let's go make some noise. They wanted everybody's attention. And then the Pharisees would come up and they would proudly deposit and dump in a bag of coins into the treasury chest. And it made a lot of noise as they circled through that drum. They wanted everyone to see that they were giving. And this is what Jesus was observing. In some ways, people do the same thing today. Have you heard about the man that stood up in the meeting and they were taking up an offering of money for a particular cause and he said, I want to give $100 anonymously. <laughs> <sighs> Jesus here was contrasting the greed of the scribes with the person on whom they prayed. This poor widow, this nameless widow. This temple treasury was located in the court of women and here Jesus sat to watch the people as they put in their offerings and he didn't condemn the people who put in a large amount his intent was to show the disciples what true sacrifice looks like Jesus said to the one who really moved his heart was the one who contributed the most to the kingdom but it was the least amount of monetary funds this little unnamed, unknown widow who had no influence and no outward posture of being worth anything in their eyes put in two tiny coins 
They were called leptons, and leptons is the smallest coin in circulation in Palestine during this time. And it was 1 64th of a denarius, which was equivalent to a day's wage for the common laborer. She came up and put in these two tiny coins that added up to being less than a penny. But because she loved her Lord with all her heart, with all her soul, all her strength, and all her mind, she gave it. And she gave it with a heart of thanksgiving. And Jesus said, truly I tell you, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the rest. What is that saying to us? What can we learn from this? I think so often we think we have to do something, some kind of activity to pay God back for what he's done. Any of y'all think that way? I know I have. I feel obligated sometimes. But you know what the truth of the matter is? Because God loves us, we should desire to want to give back. It should be something we want to do, not to be noticed, but because we want to be obedient. We think we have to serve God in certain ways. We have to win people to Christ. We have to give them our time. We have to work in open ways to see people and to, to have them come into the kingdom. But the scripture tells us over and over that our works are a response of our faith. They're not a box that we check off. Okay, go to church. Okay, put some money in the offering plate. Okay, say a prayer. Okay, be nice to people when I see them. That's not how we should be looking at it. We should be looking at it because we are motivated by love. We are motivated by what Christ has done for us, that we desire to do anything that the Holy Spirit lays on our heart, even if it costs us everything that we have. That's what Jesus was pointing out here. God doesn't want a performance. What does he want? He wants a contrite, broken heart. He wants a heart that is right with him. And he wants your attitude to be one of love. Love that first has received love from God and then respond to others in love to advance the kingdom and to be longing to serve him faithfully. Jesus indicated that the thing that was most important is not how much is given, but to the extent of how much the gift was sacrificial. Notice what he says here. To put it another way, it's not how much is given, but how much is left over in your personal use of finances they gave these scribes and these pharisees with all the attention they gave out of their abundance it was not sacrificial for them at all they made thousands of dollars in comparison to this woman and her two small coins she gave everything they gave out of their excess she gave out of her poverty that's the difference and a major element of Jesus' teaching is that attitude is more important than our actions. The widow's total giving demonstrates an attitude of absolute and complete total trust in God. Do you think she wondered where her meal was going to come from if she gave all her money? Absolutely, I'm sure she did. But she had faith enough to know that God would provide for her needs. How often do we not give in abundance because we worry, how am I going to pay the bills? How am I going to write this check out and, and cover that mortgage? I've shared with you my personal testimony over and over about how God always provides in those times of testing. Amen. Is he testing you? Have you been giving out of your abundance or have you been giving out of your need to be totally surrendered to God? Sometimes money is an obstacle to full surrender. Give to God what is God's and trust him to provide. That's what we all need to be doing. These words that Jesus spoke should cause us to examine and search our own hearts and our own motivations. We know how true they are because we know who we really are inside, don't we? Here, this poor widow who loved the Lord with all her heart, soul, mind, and strength, and she got immortalized namelessly, anonymously, for all eternity. Here we are 2,000 years after the situation took place and we're still talking about her because she was a great example. The woman didn't call attention to herself. 
She didn't ask to be elevated to fame by Jesus for all time. She was poor, yet she gave all that she had. God doesn't look on the amount of money a person gives, but he looks upon the attitude in which it's giving. Is it giving as an act of worship or is it giving out of obligation or is it giving out of a, a sense of duty? Why do you give really matters? It matters to God. Therefore, it should matter to you. This widow put in all she had. So because she did that, she had to trust Jesus with her life. And this can provide us with an answer to Peter's statement all the way back in Mark 10, 28. You remember what he said? But Jesus, we've left everything to follow you. Jesus said, that's good. Now trust me. Hold on to me. Enjoy the journey because I have great things for you. The expression we see here towards the end of our passage, summoning his disciples to him, indicates that teaching was intended for all disciples that followed after them as well. The disciples were taught to be generous. Therefore, we're taught to be generous, right? They were to give of their all just as the widow did. So therefore, we should give of our all just as the widow did. The sacrificial gift of the widow points to the sacrificial gift of Jesus. He modeled it first. She gave of her entire livelihood. What did Jesus do? He gave of his entire life. And Paul put it this way. He said, you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for our sake he became poor. So that through his poverty, you and I, we, might become what? Rich. We are co-heirs with Jesus Christ. Everything belongs to him. Everything. And we get to share in it. Those that give sacrificially will not be forgotten by God. And with this illustration, Jesus ended his public ministry. In C.S. Lewis's classic, Mere Christianity, Lewis takes us directly to the heart of our faith when he addresses the identity of Jesus Christ. And the response that we provide to his question is of paramount importance. He presents a trilemma. Either Jesus is a liar, he's a lunatic, or he's Lord. And that's become famous for people to share the truth of who Jesus is. But these are the words of C.S. Lewis himself as he expands on this idea. Quote, I am trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him, meaning Jesus. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. Who does that sound like? Sounds like the scribes and the Pharisees, doesn't it? That is the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on a level with the man who says he is a poached egg or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him and kill him as a demon or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. That option is not left open to us. He did not intend to be just that. He is Lord. He is Lord. He is Lord. It's so clear, isn't it? Jesus is both David's son and David's savior. Jesus is both David's son and God's son. Jesus is both human and divine. Jesus is both God and man. So now that you know who Jesus is, there can no longer be any wavering. You can't be sitting on the fence any longer because you have heard the truth. You must decide, are you for him or are you against him? You must decide, is Jesus your savior 
Or will he be your judge? To say no to him today will only bring judgment when you stand before God and you have to explain why when you heard the truth of the gospel today in this place and you still rejected him as Lord. So please, I implore you, I beg you, choose wisely because your eternal destiny depends on it. Pray with me. Father in heaven, we thank you for this opportunity to examine your word and to hear the truth of what you said and what you're saying to us today. We have to ask the question and answer it. Who is Jesus? Is he Lord? Or do we think him to be a liar or a lunatic? Is he Savior? Or will he be our judge? We will either receive him and accept him and believe on him, or we will turn away. There's no middle road. We have to decide. So today, Lord, I pray as we prepare to go into a time of invitation where we will sing and be in a spirit of prayer, that if there is anyone who is here today who has never made that choice, who has never answered the question as to who Jesus truly is, they have seen the evidence today. They've seen the truth. And I pray that you will stir in their heart a sense of need a sense of despair that if they leave this place and they die today, that they will be separated for all eternity and they will be in a place called hell where there is nothing but sorrow and weeping and regret and punishment for sin. Lord, you provided a way. When you went to the cross and shed your blood and presented your body as a living sacrifice as you call us to do you covered us with your righteousness you conquered death and because you conquered death if we believe in who you say you are if we trust you and we profess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord then we are co-heirs with you and we will get to the joy of spending eternity with you so, Lord, have your way with us. Lead us in this time. And may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.